great to be here, Tina Kojo, Tina Kojo, Tina Kojo Katoa. I first came to this event about three years ago and, and I thought it was a really, really fabulous event and I hope, you know, today is a day out of the farm and, and getting stimulation and just, you know, seeing a bit more of the world and I think that's what I want to really talk about today is, you know, what is the future for red meat? I think there's a lot of really contentious talk out there right now and I, I guess I want to challenge some of that thinking but also challenge some of your own thinking. Does anyone know who this fellow is? I didn't know who he was either, so that's fine. So he's uh, the former Blockbuster CEO. And they, they were offered the opportunity to buy Netflix at a very early stage. So anyway, this chap here is the former Blockbuster CEO. And at a very early stage in Netflix's life, Blockbuster were offered the opportunity to buy Netflix. And... They basically turned down this offer because their view was that there was no future in live streaming. And I always like to think of the conversation that took place and, and a bunch of people around the boardroom, and let's face it, this is a big private company, so there were probably a bunch of, of blokes around the boardroom. And, and um, John here leaning over to, to Bob and, and sort of leaning back in his chair and going, no, no, chortle, chortle, there's no future and live streaming. And, and Melissa Clark Reynolds, who's a very fabulous person, and she's on the Beef and Lamb board, which I think is super, she has a, a great line that I like to think about. And she says, beware the incumbent's chortle. And I think it's something really worth thinking about and challenging ourselves with. And I was lucky enough not so long ago to hear Rosie Bosworth speak. So have you heard Rosie Bosworth speak, anyone here? She's very outspoken about the future of cellular agriculture or synthetic meat and with that the associated lack of future for New Zealand primary products. And this is a, this is a tweet here from um, someone, a, a tech person within Christchurch along the same kind of lines. New Zealand's in danger of fast becoming the Detroit of agriculture. A rust belt left behind after production has moved elsewhere. So when I first heard Rosie speak, I had a really interesting reaction. At first, I was a little bit gobsmacked because she was basically telling me and others in the room that the future of this industry that we've worked all our lives in um, was stuffed. And that was pretty hard to hear. And then I had a really defensive reaction and I became very, very angry. And I went away for a week and I thought about that reaction. I thought, why did I have that reaction? And I think it's, it comes down to that sort of fight or flight response when someone comes out and threatens your industry so directly. And I thought, well, okay, there is some, you know, there is something behind what she's saying, but does, does it have to be as extreme as she's saying? And I'm really excited to hear Nick speak next because he's going to talk a lot more about uh, the, the future of the red meat industry in terms of the story. And so what I really want to touch about on here is what's happening in the world, how do we position ourselves and, and what else can we do on an innovation front that really helps us lead in terms of our red meat products and associated agricultural products. So now I want to sort of take a step back from cellular agriculture and go roaming around the world and, and get you thinking, I guess, about what consumers might be eating in India or Afghanistan or, or any country that we might be associated with in terms of our products. So as I said, we're, we're hearing some pretty big doom and gloom scenarios around the future of red meat and cellular agriculture. And the flip side of that, we've got the, the FAO is coming out, and, or sorry, the WHO is coming out and saying that annual meat production is projected to increase 280 million tonnes to 376 million tonnes um, over the next, uh, until two, 2030. It's a pretty massive increase, and where is that production increase going to come? So can any, does anyone care to guess? This is a farm about, that I visited about an hour out of Beijing, depending on the traffic. So not very far from a huge major city. Does anyone care to guess what that is farmed and what's being farmed in those boxes? Pigs, chickens. It's actually a sheep farm. And any of you who went to this farm and looked at the feed costs and what appeared to be returned to that farmer and everything associated that with that would, would, would question how on earth a system like this could possibly work. And so I've seen at quite a few of these type of operations, we've just been asked by um, a massive company in Russia to, uh, that are looking up, setting up um, 100,000 sheep operations in Russia. So there are 
while we're getting this, you know, proteins at an end and cellular agriculture as a future, the flip side of that is we've got countries investing massively into livestock production, including sheep. And as I said, if you looked at the numbers, you wouldn't actually work out how a farm like this could stack up. But then you peel back the layers of, of Chinese business, and I've never got really very deep into the onion, but if you peel, start peeling back the layers, there are, there are subsidies and, and many things that are going on underneath that that mean these types of organisations actually do stack up. And to think about it, and to think about why, if you think about a country like China, uh, over a billion people, uh, massive, you know, massive number of mouths to feed, um, a political regime whereby uh, it's very much a you know, communist country. So if you get unrest, then that's very difficult to manage with so many people. And one of the, one of the key things that will cause unrest is food security or lack of food or lack of trust in food. And that's really, really critical to think about when we start talking about the future of food and, and the people start questioning, well, you know, how are we going to produce enough? And I think... It's not necessarily that we can't produce enough, it's actually more about how we produce it and those countries having um, security and, and safetyness around their food. So flipping on, on the other side and going then from production to the consumer, I did some uh, work with Alliance Group a number of years ago which allowed me to meet with a number of Chinese consumers and ask a bunch of questions around red meat and what were their preferences around red meat. But I was struck by a conversation that I had with a Chinese mum, and I've, I've never forgotten it, because it was one of those conversations that actually made me think ah, that there's a, that she, she's, that's why she's thinking, that's, that's the actions behind those behaviours. So she described to me, I asked her, how did she buy her red meat, and you know, what kind of process did she go under? And, and at the time, you know, I was a typical mum myself, and when I buy my own products for my own children, I walk into a supermarket, and I pretty much buy what's there and I don't do a whole lot of research and I don't really question it, I walk out and I feed them. And that's, you know, that's pretty normal Kiwi mum. So she, before she even went near any retail outlet, would do hours and hours of research on the internet, understanding the companies that she might buy from. But not only that, she would also do hours of research, understanding all their suppliers, so anyone who supplied the company that she was buying from, and research their suppliers. So try as much as she could to research that whole value chain into what was that final product. And the other thing she did was go onto social media and share all her findings. So there's this whole web around food safety and buying of food that we don't even think about. And I think that was very important for me in understanding the kind of layers of evidence that we need to be putting behind our product. Because a label is just one very, very high level, but it has to lead into a bunch of things that give that sort of consumer security that what she's feeding her baby or her toddlers is going to be the very best and the very safest product. So at, an, at another level in terms of uh, global food trends, which I think is really fascinating and I'm not sure we're all sort of watching with tender hooks, even at a local level, you know, what is the effect of climate change uh, going to be on things like trade, but also production? And so President Xi Jinping has come out and said publicly that he wants the Chinese uh, people to eat less meat for environmental and health reasons. Now, he's said it reasonably softly, but what, you know, what, what might happen in five years is he comes out at a much harder level and says, you may only eat meat once a week. And that, I'm not saying that will happen, but these are the kind of things that can happen in terms of thinking about trade and thinking about food and our role in the world. So these are things that we need to be thinking about to help us position our products to, be, to survive, basically. And this one is a really positive one. I think this is very exciting, and this is a huge opportunity. So I wear a Fitbit. Does anyone else wear a Fitbit? Have you nearly thrown it away a few times? So it's a... It's a device that you wear on your wrist and it measures how many steps you do or you don't do on any day and often I don't do enough. I have to say though that I, I racked up 24,000 steps on the dance floor in Singapore. So <laughs> that's my, uh, that's my greatest, greatest achievement with my Fitbit. But anyway, with, with my Fitbit, um, when I put the device on, I, I hook it up to my phone. So I download the app on my phone. And when I download the app on my phone, I give this company all this information about myself. So I tell them my age, my weight, you know, my goals around 
foot steps and, and weight and so forth. And I can even put dietary information. And so I give them that information free. Uh, this is this company that I know nothing about. Um, and then on top of that, this company gets to see what I do every day in terms of how many steps I take, how many times I get up during the night. So imagine the kind of things that you can start doing with this data. And this is the tip of the iceberg in terms of personalised health. When we, there's a company in the States called Habit, and they are now offering to take blood tests of people and they do some basic genomic analysis, and it is pretty basic, I think some of the science behind what they're doing is a bit sketchy, but they do some basic DNA analysis of that blood, and then they feed information back to that consumer as to the type of diet they should be following. So again, that's a company which has started down this track, but there will be a point where I will get home from work and everything will have been tracked on me, there'll be some, something in my blood or something that I'm wearing, everything's been tracked for me, I'll go to open the fridge, and the fridge will push out what I need to eat for the day, which probably won't be very much, and it'll all be based on my activities for that day and my plan. So these are the kinds of things that are ahead. Are ahead. Uh, and, and I think it's really exciting from a, 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 a food for a, for a country that is a country of food producers. It's a really, really exciting opportunity to understand how we might target our products around this space. And then finally, I will touch very, really on, on some of the, really, what, what, what is the synthetic meat? What, are, what is it that's happening and, and what are people trying to do? And I've put a bunch of links here, which I'm not going to go into, but um, my, the presentation is available online, so you're welcome to go and, and there's some videos there which help explain cellular agriculture or synthetic meat really well. So essentially, what the, this big trend around synthetic or cultured or clean meat, they call it clean meat, which I think is just awful, but anyway, uh, is that essentially cells are taken from an animal and they are put into um, a medium which consists of blood and sugar and um, amino acids, or blood as sort of as a nutrient source, and then they um, are put into these sort of scaffold type reactors where they are shaken around um, lots and lots so that they, they then grow bigger and they grow ar around the scaffold so they get some sort of texture and then they're pumped into some sort of mince product and the end product is something equivalent or like the Impossible Burger. So that's, that's the really basics of, of synthetic uh, meat culturing. And there's a whole lot of work going around how you might take it from a mince product to a muscle product. And you can imagine that gets a lot more complicated because you've got different fibres and muscles and different textures. And, and basically trying to, in a lab, produce what you people are, are producing on farm. That's, that's the guts of it. And I think someone said to me something really interesting lately, uh, and I think it was a quote from Bill Gates, but it was around that you underestimate, no, you overestimate what you can do in two years, but you underestimate what you can do in 10 years. And I suspect that this might be what's going to happen around the synthetic meat space. One of my colleagues um, is, uh, travels and goes to these big international conferences around this to get a really good understanding of this space, and, and he said to me, Anna, from this year when he went, compared to the last time he went, he said the progress has been massive. Uh, where the biggest challenge is is around this big bioreactor space, so it's around scaling. They've basically got the ability to make the product, but they can't scale it and make it cheap, and that's what they're investing massive amount of money into now. Okay, so that's what's happening in the world, and, or just a part of what's happening in the world. How do we respond as an industry and as farmers, and how do we not have that defence reaction or that angry reaction that I had to Rosie Bosworth? And um, that's, I think it's really important to, to find solutions and to push ahead and, and not get despondent. So I heard a really um, a great speaker put this into context for me, and I think it was really, really important. And he said, if you look at the world and the world of food, there are, it's basically you can divide it into two areas in, in, in terms of food innovation. And he called it the undone and the redone. So one big food trend area is, is, forming, is, is falling into this undone food. And I think of bluff oysters as your classic undone food. You know, you buy bluff oysters, you, you hope that, it's, that they're completely natural. You don't expect when you buy bluff oysters to have a whole lot of information on the nutrient pack. It's pretty much what they describe as clean labels. So it's beautiful natural, tasty food, 
that when you eat a bluff oyster, there's something about it that just takes you to bluff. You know, it's that whole experience, emotional experience, and that feeling of connectivity to where that food was produced. And, you know, there's a, if you go around and look in supermarkets and you read about food trends, there is a, a, a really strong wish from people to get back to what their grandmothers did, what their great grandmothers did, that, uh, I guess, nostalgic wish that things were more simple. And so that is obviously an, an enormous opportunity for New Zealand food producers around the undone food. Look at our beautifully produced product in natural conditions. These are animals not shut up in, in houses in Beijing. Uh, you know, exemplary taste, exemplary quality. You know, what you guys are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. That's, that's, there's a, a fantastic opportunity uh, provided we tell that story really well and, and that's what Nick's going to talk about next. So I think that's a really exciting opportunity. And, but I've, I, I will often get asked, shouldn't we just be putting all our eggs into that basket? And I say, no, I think we should also be exploring what, I call, what, what we call the redone basket. And so the redone basket is really producing this, maybe the same or slightly different food to what we eat now, but redoing it. So meat is a classic example, synthetic meat is the extreme example of that, or synthetic milk. But there are also a bunch of products that sits partway between the extreme and the undone. And to me, that's, there's a really big opportunity when we think about that connection to human health, about what we can do in the redone food as well. And so, as I said, the, the, I think there's big opportunities in the undone, and, and, and beef and lamb are doing some really great work into this space. And really now I want to just quickly talk about protein and, and think about protein, and think about what the opportunities are in protein particularly thinking about what the opportunities might be in that redone space. So if you think about protein and what's happening in the trends of protein, really categorise them into four categories. So that's the real, real food, which is the undone, and that, you know, where we are working in that space, and so we should. Plant-based meat substitutes, and it's interesting that this has got so much media now, because I think plant-based type meat substitutes have been around for a very long time, when you think of tofu burgers and some of these things. That's not like they're overly new, but um, when the, uh, the CEO of a, one of these burger companies, or fo fake burger companies, spoke to us, what he said is different now is that with those, maybe those tofu type burgers, they were really for a small section of consumers. They were, so they were, for the, they were for the vegetarians and the vegans, and that's where they sit in the, in the vegetarian and vegan type aisle. But where they're wanting to position these new burger products is right smack alongside the meat products. They're not interested in the 5% or less of vegetarians and vegans. They want to be competing in the meat space. So that's, that's really where the plant-based meat substitutes sit as well. And there's probably opportunities for New Zealand in that space as well. You know, we do grow things well. Um, synthetic meat we've talked about. And what I really want to just have a few slides now on is this, this, this idea of what, what could we do in this space of what I call composite or, or functional food. You know, what, what can we do with our meat products uh, to, to hit this health type trend that's happening. And really the first thing we've got to do a lot more of is just understand the functional components of meat and offal products that are already there. And this sounds, I'm sure you're sitting there thinking there must be heaps of research on this. And there kind of is and there isn't. So there's some research and we have a, a reasonable understanding of the nutritional content of our products, but what we don't necessarily have an understanding of is what that might mean for a consumer in, in need. For example, you know, what, what does a beautiful uh, liver type product um, mean for an elderly person who's iron deficient and can't swallow? Do we have the clinical data to back up a positioning for something like that? So we really need to understand more around what's in that food and how we might use that food. And, and just to give you an example, I work, worked with a, a Otago nutritionist and she was working with Meat and Livestock Australia and they were developing desiccated liver products to shake onto rice for um, Indonesian children to get iron balance. And I think it was done really for MLA as much as a trade into, into Indonesia kind of move as much as it was a product move, but I thought it was a really interesting concept, you know, what are the things that we could be doing with our base products. And then look around New Zealand, how do we complement our red meat products? So understand what's in them, 
But Zestry has done an, an, an extraordinary amount of work around understanding whole kiwi fruit and its role in the digestion, and they're using that in their marketing and so forth in China. It's pretty, pretty impressive. Could we be working with these types of organisations to, to combine and, and complement what our red meat products have with some health attributes of other products? And there's apple fibre as another example. There's a project here at Massey that's looking at apple fibre and as a substitute um, for things like um, dextrose, which is the awful corn type syrup that's used in, as thickness. So what, what are the kind of things that we could be doing? And then really, how do we marry them? And you know, what, what, what could we be doing to develop the types of food that are complete food packages for people with basic health needs, so just every day, but also with targeted health needs? Um, and I think this is some really interesting, uh, any of you have seen Clay Christensen's work around the milkshake, the thought of uh, when you're developing a product of 30,000 new products that are launched every year, 95% fail. And I'm not a marketer, but I think, what, I think that what he tells is a very simple story. And it's a story of McDonald's milkshakes and why people were buying them and understanding that. So the link is there. I urge you to go and read some of the work around this. But it's very interesting. It's basically flipping it back and saying, what job is it that we want our food to do? And so thinking about that consumer, what job is it we want our food to do? And how do we then, so when we know what job we want our food to do, our food product to do, then how do we match the science to make sure that we have the evidence behind that product to meet that need? And uh, I found this company recently, a uh, really very exciting company, I think, New Zealand company. And they, they're called the Pure Food Company. They were in the Deloitte Fast 50 last year. And an, an incredible story, the, the stepfather of the two young men that set the company up uh, was suffering from uh, cancer of the jaw and, and had completely lost his love of food because he couldn't eat sort of whole foods or he couldn't chew. And they, they came up with this concept, well they were obviously working with their stepfather, but then they then came up with this concept of a business around really beautiful pureed food for that kind of target market, so elderly or, or people who are struggling to swallow. And they've set up this business and they've got meat products as well as vegetable products. And I, and I think it's kind of a stunning New Zealand story of a company who have said, what job are we trying to achieve? We've got this incredibly beautiful produce, how do we match the two? And I'm really excited to watch their progress and I hope they continue to do really well. Uh, to give you an international story, there's a fabulous yogurt story, um, Chibana Yogurt out of the States. And he basically didn't uh, started the business because he, he didn't like American yogurt. Um, but what was really interesting in terms of how they ended up, this yogurt so they ended up being positioned, is that he ended up not necessarily attacking the yogurt market, but perhaps without meaning to, he ended up um, having causing big problems to those that were in the breakfast market or the cereal market. And so it's understanding again, how, you know, what what job could your product be doing? So people were liking this as a, as a fast to go breakfast type product, and so then the cereal guys were getting were getting hammered, the big cereal players. Um, I don't expect you to read that, but I just put it up there to show that, you know, because I'm a scientist, I love to see science behind product. This is another really uh, great New Zealand product which is being launched, and it's a boysenberry product around lung health and really targeting Asian populations where there's, there's challenges around pollution. So how do we get there? You know, we've got, we've got some wonderful exemplars. You know, what, what do we need to do as an industry to get to these kinds of, and get more of these kinds of innovations? So in the rest of my talk, I'm going to ask some questions and then really describe what I see as the innovation environment in New Zealand and, and what we could be doing more of. So I think in terms of these questions is, there's a whole lot of discussion around we should be adding value and there's, I think there's resistance from the big players because they know that but they're not necessarily in a position to be able to do that. And what do we want as a country? I don't feel that there's any, any necessarily any really big New Zealand Inc. answer to say, well, okay, if we're about five, maybe six, up to 10 at max value add now, and that might mean further packaging or it might mean premium or it might mean health products, what would it take as a country to lift that to 20, 30 or 40 percent? Do we know? Um, what is and what you know? What do we mean by value add? And this is this is a, this is a, I'm not expecting to answer this now. But what, you know, what are we trying to achieve? Are we trying to go the full gambit into a sort of a fast-moving consumer goods space, or are we trying to attack kind of niche health areas? What what are we trying to achieve? And 
what, what investment's required. And there will have to be government investment if we do a massive play into this kind of space. But there may also have to be investment into smaller companies, and I'll talk about that in a minute as well in terms of where innovation comes from. And what does something like this look like in a value chain? Because it's not necessarily the value chain that we might see with our traditional meat companies. We might be requiring a completely different look. So how does that fit? And what, what kind of capability do we require? And what do we need in terms of basic science that might happen in our CRIs or our universities that sit behind this kind of strategy? There's a really great book from Jim Collins. Any of his books are fantastic. I urge you to read them, they're just great. But, um, and there's a chapter in his latest one where he talks about firing bullets and, and then cannonballs. And I think this is really important. I think, I think we've been a little bit too reliant on some of our very big players as a country, like the Fonterras, to be the ones that are innovating for the country. And I don't believe anymore that that's necessarily the right place to be putting our hopes. Um, around Jim Collins' philosophy, it's really a business philosophy, is that you need to fire a bunch of bullets because there will be bullets that don't hit their targets. So there will be things that fail left, right and centre and we need to be able to understand that and from an R&D and a government investment and a <laughs> private investment, we need to be um, betting on a lot of horses basically and then when we actually find the right ones, then we invest heavily in them and fire our cannonball. And I think it's a really good concept to think about in terms of this type of investment. So just to go back a couple of steps now, so I want to talk about, these are, these are people that are in um, our business, Abacus Bio, and they come from all over the world. They're all working in sort of agricultural industry. So on your front left is um, Bruno, who's from, um, from Brazil, and then next to him is Gertrude, and then at the back is Nana from Ghana, and then um, me from China, and the top, your top left is uh, Natalie from Southland, and I think it's always a bit of a relief when I say yeah, we've got a, we've got New Zealanders in our business as well. But what I put, why I put these people up is that I think they, they just like, and I, I'm really careful about saying this because I actually don't think innovation is just in the eyes of the young. Um, in fact, if any of you know Peter Fennessy, do any of you know Peter Fennessy in our business? So he's our founder. He's he's just hit 70. He's just celebrated his 70 year old birthday, and he would be one of the most innovative thinkers that we have. So I'm definitely not saying that innovation is, should only be in the hands of the young. But what I want, what I put these people up is, I, they've got a different mindset around a, a quite a few things that I think is worth exploring. And there's a really good white paper reference just at the bottom there that's just come out by a company called Zero Point Ventures. And it's asking, in terms of how we create innovation, what do we need to do? And, and in the paper they talk about, you know, the big companies that have set up what they call innovation hubs and innovation managers and so forth, but it's really questioning whether, whether these kind of companies actually have the capacity to be truly innovative. And I think it's a very interesting question because it then turns to what it takes to be really innovative and, and what does it take to be really innovative and it talks about this mindset of entrepreneurship. And I, I don't wish to denigrate big companies when I say this, but if you think about a big company, generally their reason for being is efficiency and process and pumping things out the door at low cost and maximising profit. And, and our meat companies would generally be in that kind of space. So the, the type of environment in terms of the structure of the company and some of the things like hierarchy is not necessarily conducive to what we would describe, or this paper describes, as a mindset of entrepreneurship, which is far more free thinking and far less rule bound than if you're in a big hierarchical type organisation. And I know that as you as farmers, because you're running more, you, you're, you are running businesses where you can make decisions quite quickly um, by yourself, and you will have pockets in your, on your businesses where you are innovating and you're testing and you're you're, I guess, creating these bullets. So you might test, for example, lucerne in, in just a small area before you decide to change, do a whole systems change around the whole farm. So I think farmers understand this mindset of entrepreneurship because generally small businesses kind of have to survive by being entrepreneurial. And that is really around taking risks and accepting failure. And accepting failure is a really big one because I think in a small company that's much more accepted than it is in a large hierarchical company uh, where failure is frowned upon and you basically spend a lot of your time covering 
your behind and making sure that you're behaving. The other thing that my young team have really, really shown me, which I think is really, really exciting, is this concept of sharing. And I think this is very new to the generation coming through. And I use this example of R. So has any of, any of you heard of R? It's a, it's a basically, when you, when you code software or, or do a bunch of maths, you can, you can use this, what they call open source um, product where basically people share code and you can jump and you can use anyone's code and you can develop your own code and then you can do these fabulous um, things around building software but also around mathematical modeling and, and a bunch of things. Now, my, we, in our business, we use a product called SAS, which we pay tens of thousands of dollars for to pay to a license to a big US company to have access to however many licenses we want for our people to do our analysis. Now, the young people, they don't use SAS. They have to pay, we would have to pay for it. Why would we use that? They just jump onto R. It's open source. They're sharing. And to me, that is quite a big shift in terms of how we work and thinking about how we set our companies up to be innovative. So how do we set up this kind of sharing environment which promotes innovation and um, greater progress? And I, I think it's, 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 it's easy to be critical and say that there isn't innovation happening. And I think um, if I look at the big companies, I think there is innovation happening, but it, it does tend to be that sort of iterative innovation, step, step, step. It doesn't tend to be the really creative kind of stuff. Um, and just to give you a couple of other really great New Zealand examples, um, have you heard of the rocket apple? So uh, this, was a ro this was an apple that was, the plant variety rights were developed by Plant and Food. It's a small little apple, and apparently it's very tasty. I haven't actually tasted it, but it's got a very tiny little core, so it's not like a, a big apple that didn't grow. It's actually a proper cultivar that's small and tasty. And um, Steve Saunders talks about, you know, so he, he, he is a big owner of the company and a, and a great New Zealand innovator, and he talks about how he took it out um, internationally, and part of the, the the whole the whole I guess deal around the rocket apple is, is again what job did they want that rocket apple to do? So they set that job around snacking and a nice small product that people could fit in their lunch boxes or fit in this fabulous tube in their um, school bags. And it's a really great story of a product that plant and food didn't really know what to do with, and someone came in and said, there's a job for that product, I'm gonna take it around the world, and it's been an incredible uh, world success. Another New Zealand primary product is a company called Lanico, which is a, a wool fiber company, and they've developed a, with AgriSearch, they've taken some IP out of AgriSearch and developed a way of combining wool in a way to produce these face masks, but and the face masks are for people in Beijing who are living in hideous pollution, but what was really cool about that is that they took that a step further and they brought Karen Walker in to design actually cool looking face masks. So instead of these horrible medical looking boring face masks, they actually just have developed a fashion, uh, fashion item face mask. And so these are companies along with the likes of Pure Food Co that are doing really, really cool things and hopefully will keep growing on the, or are, uh, already in the international stage, but already can keep growing on the international stage. And so if I go back to this concept of small innovators and large companies, I want to then now just quickly touch on the big four. So these are the big meat companies in the world. Tyson, Cargill, JBS, and National Beef. Interestingly, Tyson and Cargill have both invested in Memphis Meats, which is one of the synthetic meat companies. And Originally, we said everyone sort of looked on. I thought maybe they are investing in this type of company to a understand how they might shut it down. But actually, I think what they are trying to do is say, well, actually, this is going to complement our main protein supply, and we need to be in this game as well. So they are buying the innovators, and this is happening in food companies all over the world. So Campbell's Soup have just bought a uh, have, have just bought a bunch of innovative food companies that they're a big craft company. It's happening everywhere. And then right on our doorstep, well, I'm from Dunedin, so right on my doorstep, JBS, which is the world's biggest red meat company and Brazilian-owned, has just bought 51% of Scott Technology, which is a really innovative um, company that works with Silver Fern Farm and others to and has developed robots around um, animal processing. So just to, I think what I'm really what I'm really getting to is that. I think we need to recognise that innovation doesn't necessarily, 
and we can't rely on innovation happening in our big companies. We have to be able to create an environment where our small companies are supported and realise that that's where a lot of the innovation is going to come and then potentially help that partnership so the big companies can buy them out and do the scaling that they do really, really well. I think if I go back to my, my very first slide, the blockbuster slide, and the discussion around you know the people at the board table, and I, I don't, when I say this, I'm not really, I don't want people to be offended, but I think if you look at people who are well established and companies who are well established, what is in their interest, why are things in their interest to change? And, and you compare that to a small innovator who is relying on their whole business for survival, it's, it's quite a different mindset. So I'm sitting at a board table of an established company or I'm the CEO of an established company. I might be getting, I don't know, upwards of a you know, million dollars a year for salary. Um, it's in my best interest not to have big failures. It's in my best interest to get that ship running really, really efficiently but not necessarily to turn the ship. And this is a, a great quote from 1513. For he who innovates will have for his enemies those who are well off under the existing order of things. So for me, there's a message there that the innovators actually need to be, we need to support our innovators in these smaller clusters and then allow uh, change to happen through that. And I really just want to finish, this is my last slide, and um, with a bit of a story, I guess. Uh, with Tesco, a number of years ago, 2015, made a loss of over £6 billion, which is pretty impressive. And <laughs> would have been incredibly frightening for them. But when you read the data about why they made that loss and how that loss came about, um, there, there were some things that were happening in the supermarket industry in the UK that were really big. So Sainsbury and Marks and Spencer's very much had that top end or that premium end, and then there were new, uh, new players that were coming in at the bottom end, and they were really coming in at the kind of the, what we would call the pack and save budget end, so the likes of Aldi. And that, was a, that used to be Tesco's place, much more at that bottom end. And so the, the financial commentators and the business commentators basically came out and said Tesco's were trying to move up into the premium end, and they lost their bottom end, and they ended up in the middle and being nothing and losing 6.4 billion. So for me, the message out of that is New Zealand can't afford to be that piggy in the middle. Um, in terms of the threats that are happening, we can't afford to be playing in the commodity space, in my view. So if we're going to be at the bottom end, you have to be bloody good at producing commodities hugely efficiently, and you have to be a, a, a machine where you might house animals and you pump stuff out. That's, that, to me, that is never going to be our future. It, it can't possibly be. So we have to be at the top end, and to be at the top end, we have to make sure that we set up structures and we invest in R&D and innovation and people so that we can really compete at that top end. Because if we are that piggy in the middle, we will be the Tesco of the food world. Uh, not Edda, and I'm open to some questions. I think there's some time. Is it? If you um, put, put your hand up, if you've got a question, and we'll get a mic to you. So we we got... Um, Anyone? Yep, got a question here, Bevan. Um, thank you, Anna. Um, fascinating presentation. The um, a lot of what we were looking at on the slides is very innovative products, but um, but all of them appear in um, packaging and packets and stuff that it goes around it. And I guess in a world of uh, ever diminishing resources, um, packaging is probably something that may have to look at the amount of stuff yep. that it is. So I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, and there's some re and again there's some really innovative things happening around packaging in terms of packaging that has an enzyme that eats the packaging at the end of it, you know, um, kind of unusual things like that, but also uh, edible packaging, a whole lot of things around that. It is really interesting because I've just been looking at this in the vegetable world. Um, consumers don't want necessarily their tomatoes to be in a package, um, but they kind of do want it as well. And I was describing this to someone last night. I travelled through India last year. And if you go anywhere like that and you see the amount of plastic rubbish, it's, it's pretty mind-blowing. But um, because they have a, really, a lot of poor consumers, what the big companies are doing is, so you know the shampoos that we might get in a hotel, um, they are selling those consumers that because they can't afford to buy a whole bottle of shampoo, so they'll buy something small. So you end up with even more packaging. So 
it's a, it's a massive problem. I think we're starting to innovate around the edges of it. But it's also a challenge, I guess, in th terms of thinking about the undone part. So for me, um, the undone part is perhaps where we sit and we look at that natural packaging and the whole natural story and, and, and there's that part of it and then innovation around the packaging itself. It's, it's not an easy thing, um, but my husband, who is an ex-farmer, ex-dairy farmer, I, he actually started saying to me, we need to reduce our packaging. And for me, that was an alarm bell that actually, <laughs> that actually it's getting into mainstream, if he's thinking about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, not denigrating him, but yeah, it's, it's a problem. Um, there's a really cool story in the Kyoto magazine that I read just on the way up of, you know, this is some of the opportunities in packaging. So there's a car cardboard company that developed innovative cardboard packaging. So he's basically a cardboard oregonist, if you like, and really cool innovative packaging from cardboard. So there's some fun to have in the innovation space as well. Yes, Anna, that's a um, fascinating uh, presentation. Anna, we've got a... Um, um, a market-led model, um, you're talking about taking us to a more entrepreneurial model. That needs a backing of, of science funding. Um, so how do, how do we get out of that? How do, how do we get, I mean, because, you know, the people that we're looking at are not in the space of, of um, grabbing a, enough capital. So how do we get more yeah, capital? Yeah, so I think we, we do have a really big problem in our funding system at the moment, and that I believe it's killing innovation. So if you talk to any scientist in New Zealand, they will tell you that a huge amount of their time is spent applying for funding. And there's some incredible stat that came out from the New Zealand Science Association that, um, that the amount of time that science spend applying for funding is far greater than what the funding is worth in terms of if you put a value on that. So again, that to me goes back to that structure and, that, and, and, th and how do we create systems where we actually allow people to go and explore and make mistakes. And um, I'm not sure I have the answer, but I do believe that stripping back some of our funding models is really, really important. And I think it's really interesting too. So thinking about where innovation happens, there's going to be innovation around products that happen in small businesses and they don't necessarily need science funding. But where I think we do need to be making sure we are investing our science money is in two areas. So there's the public good kind of funding, which will be some of the environmental challenges that you, you are going to have to face on farm, um, you know, things like lucerne, you know, it's lots of things that, that should be shared. But the other area we, nearly, we really need to be spending on and with the universities and the CRIs is what I call sort of deep IP, that a company just can't afford to invest in that kind of funding. So examples of that might be around when I talk, put those slides up with red meat products and said, well, okay, what does this liver product mean for an elderly population? What does this liver product mean for a sports population? They're incredibly expensive type trials to run. They're deep IP in that you, you get a, a, a bunch of really, really uh, great information that you can develop products out of. But we can't expect, for example, beef and lamb to be investing in massive clinical trials. They don't have the R&D dollar. So to me, those are the two areas that investment needs to be focused and we have got to work out a system of making science funding less bureaucratic. Hey, cool. Hey, um, that's um, our time's up there. So thanks for those couple of questions and um, thank you, Anna. Cool. That was um, fantastic. Listen to that. Anna, just before you go, well, Anna. Great. <laughs> thank you.